the USA is infamous for having some, let's say, interesting urban planning. Cars dominate everyday life. With a few exceptions, if you want to exist in the US, you have to own a car. In today's video, we'll look at American car-centric infrastructure, how it came to be, and the reason why it is so bad for everyone. Before the video starts, please consider subscribing. It's free and it helps out a lot. Thanks and on to the video. From the founding of St. Augustine in 1565 up to the mid-19th century, cities in the US were very dense and built around walking. In those times, if you weren't rich, the only method of transport was walking. Wealthy people could afford horse-drawn carriages, but even those weren't very fast. This meant that cities needed to be dense and walkable. With the advent of streetcars and trains, the cities got more spread out. These so-called railroad suburbs or streetcar suburbs sprung up all around the fledgling country, from New York to Los Angeles. Developments continued, transit was integrated right into the cities, and in the 1920s, Los Angeles had the biggest streetcar system in the world. Oh, how far we've come. In the late 19th and early 20th century, our old friend, the automobile, entered the picture. In 1886, Carl Benz invented the automobile. Initially, they were slow, reaching a top speed of roughly 16 kilometers or 10 miles per hour. Cars back then were seen more as a status symbol than a real alternative to taking transit. The real breakthrough came in 1908 with the Ford Model T. Innovations like mass production with the help of assembly lines helped the Model T become the truly first mass market car. More and more people started getting cars and in reaction people started pushing back. The Model T could go up to 68 km or 42 miles per hour. That speed is more than enough to kill people. Since cars weren't regulated or were regulated very lightly, fatalities caused by cars mounted. By 1918, 10,000 people were killed by motor vehicles every single year. People were getting tired of dying to dangerous drivers and in 1922, the city of Cincinnati, Ohio tried to put speed limiters on any motor vehicles operating within the city limits. If this measure passed, all cars within Cincinnati would have their top speed limited to 40 km or 25 miles per hour. The car companies knew that this would eat into their profits, so they started a massive pro-car propaganda campaign to make sure that this measure would fail. The opponents of the measure claimed that a Chinese wall would be built around Cincinnati, driving out tourists and businesses. The pro-car forces won, and the proposal failed. Road fatalities continued to increase and in 1939, 30,000 people died on American roads. In the same year, World War II began. In 1941, the US entered the war after being attacked by Japan at Pearl Harbor. The US helped the Allies win the war and in 1945, Americans began coming home from Europe and Asia. In 1944, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt signed the GI Bill into law. This bill provided benefits for soldiers returning from the war. It provided loans for education and most importantly for this video, low interest zero down payment home loans. Many veterans took advantage of this opportunity and bought large houses in areas further away from the city. These new suburbs were located on the fringes of American cities and the inhabitants drove to their jobs in the inner cities. The car industry promoted the mentality that you were supposed to drive, that driving was the future of transport and that driving meant freedom, like in this 1954 promotional movie called Give Yourself the Green Light. This is the American dream of freedom on wheels, an automotive age, traveling on time-saving super highways, Futurama's free-flowing channels of concrete and steel. Inspired by the German Reichsautobahn system, World War II general turned President Dwight D. Eisenhower signed the Federal Aid Highway Act into law in 1956. This kicked off the creation of the National Interstate System, a system of highways stretching all over the country. Americans began driving more than ever and cities began sprawling out into their surrounding areas. Riding on this automotive boom, almost all streetcar lines were shut down entirely or replaced by buses. 
There were many reasons for this. One reason was that streetcars were getting stuck in traffic because of cars blocking the tracks. The government also began pumping money into roads instead of properly funding transit systems. General Motors and other companies also bought up multiple streetcar lines and turned them into bus lines. In the 1960s, cars were at the center of American life. Every morning, suburbanites got into their cars, drove to the city for work, and 8 hours later they drove back into the suburbs. The trend of sprawling car-centric infrastructure continued and in the 2000s a new troubling trend started to rear its ugly head, the SUV. In the past, vehicles like the Land Rover were meant for farm work, but now they're bought by soccer moms ferrying their kids to school and back. This trend is troubling for multiple reasons. For example, SUVs have horrible fuel efficiency compared to smaller cars. Their larger size, heavier weight and worse aerodynamics make their mileage noticeably worse. More fuel burned also means more greenhouse gas emissions, contributing to climate change. Children are also 8 times more likely to die after being hit by an SUV rather than a passenger car, shown by this study called Effects of Large Vehicles on Pedestrian and Pedal Cyclist Injury Severity. The rise of suburbs has been bad for their inhabitants' health, like if you live here in a suburb of Phoenix, Arizona. If you don't own a car, where are you supposed to go? The nearest grocery store is 2 kilometers or 1.3 miles away through suburban streets and then along a four-lane arterial road. The sidewalk is also pitifully small and have fun breathing in all the fumes. This means that the average Americans only get 3 to 4 thousand steps per day, since you pretty much have to drive everywhere. The low amount of physical activity negatively impacts Americans' health. According to this study, health impacts of suburban development patterns. Every kilometer walk reduces the risk of obesity by 4.8%, while every hour spent in a car raises it by 6%. The suburbs are also terrible from a financial standpoint. Suburbs are inherently financially unsustainable. The sheer distance that everything from roads to power lines to water and sewage pipes have to cover contributes to high maintenance costs. When suburbs were first built, they were built with a lot of government money. But when the infrastructure needs to be repaired every 20 to 25 years, the cities have to pay for all of this. This causes a huge budget deficit, which the cities solve by borrowing money and building more suburbs. This phenomenon is called the Growth Ponzi Scheme by Strong Towns. Go check them out, they have a lot of great content. All these services have to be brought out for relatively few people, since the suburbs have very low density, with roughly 772 people per square kilometer or 2000 people per square mile. People in the suburbs say that they're more satisfied with living in the suburbs, but I believe that we need to look a little bit closer. First of all, suburbs are generally richer than urban areas. Higher income areas are generally nicer to live in, and overall happiness is correlated with income. Second of all, after the war, the cities have been neglected in favor of the suburbs. A lot of buildings were demolished to make space for parking for suburbanites. I could imagine why you could feel less happy after parts of your city get turned into a sea of parking. I believe that the higher satisfaction with the suburbs is caused by these factors and not because suburbs are inherently better than urban areas. The largest obstacle to higher densities in US cities are the zoning codes. For example, this is a zoning map of Los Angeles. All the pink zones you see on the map are land zoned for single-family detached houses. You legally cannot build anything other than a single-family detached house on that land. This leads to lower densities, since single-family zoning is inherently low density. Single-family zoning also raises the price of housing, forcing poorer people out. Change is being proposed, but the Not In My Backyard or NIMBY group is fighting tooth and nail to prevent denser housing from being built. NIMBYs often argue that denser housing will ruin the character of their neighborhood or that their property prices will go down. Ah yes, because the flat asphalt square parking lot is totally in character with the rest of the neighborhood. Studies also show that if done right, increasing density doesn't necessarily lower the value of surrounding single-family homes. Just to be clear, I am not against single-family detached houses by themselves. I am against zoning massive amounts of land for only single-family houses. I believe that people should be able to choose. However, in a lot of cities, you can only choose from single-family houses because you legally cannot build anything else. 
I believe that cities should be built for people, not for motor vehicles. I hope that the recent urban renaissance continues and sparks nationwide debates about why we are building cities the way we are doing now. Thank you for watching to the end. This has been Tramley. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next Tuesday. Bye.